My name is Audrey, and I've had the joy of being part of the Lighthouse family since 2010 as a college student. Being part of this church has been an immense blessing to me as I've taken on different ministry roles, sat under sound teaching, and been encouraged by treasured friends over the past decade here. In the beginning of 2020, my parents separated, and shortly thereafter, I filled out an application to receive biblical counseling at Lighthouse. My parents' separation wasn't actually the main cause that propelled me towards counseling, but it was significant in that in its aftermath, I started to realize that I may have experienced verbal and emotional abuse as a child at the hand of a parent. I began to recall events growing up and began to realize in retrospect that those events may not be of a typical healthy upbringing. Some trusted friends suggested I look into counseling and I hesitated because at that point in my life, I wasn't falling off the rails. I was taking care of myself just fine, and I had a good job, and I had long-term friendships. I didn't have any of those stereotypical red flags that I thought would warrant needing intense intervention. But I suspected that my childhood likely impacted me more deeply than I could perceive at that point, which is what led me to counseling. I remember thinking to myself, this will probably hurt a lot, but I know that if I pursue honesty and humility, God can do so much more than I can ask or think through this experience. I would describe my counseling experience in two parts. The first characterized by a lot of pain, but the second characterized by overwhelming hope. And all of it characterized by a lot of tears, but that might just be because I'm kind of a crier. One of the first thing I remember doing was filling out an abuse inventory. At the time, I thought it was kind of excessive, but my apprehension was likely due to the fact that I didn't want to dig up painful memories that I'd successfully buried. My counselor was gentle and encouraging, and her specific care to me as I took this on was incredibly valuable and I wouldn't have been able to go through this inventory without her. And it was painful. There were a lot of tears as I recounted memories of my parent ignoring me for days because I made them mad or being locked out of my house after being told that they didn't want me anymore or being told I was worthless because I didn't do what they wanted me to. I was made to feel like all of my suffering was my fault and that belief is what my counselor and I really had to take apart. As we digested the abuse I experienced, I saw that every part of my life as an adult had been permeated by this belief that the outcomes of my life rested on me alone. I felt hopeless. Not only do I struggle with these sin issues, but I also now have knowledge of how I'd been controlled by my past hurts. I found myself asking, Will there be a time where I won't feel so suffocated by this? Will there be a day where I can truly act in freedom from these things and not perpetuate the brokenness that's plagued my family for generations? I love this parent deeply, but how do I step out with trust in God when the potential for us to hurt each other is so high? Our sessions for the next several months looked surprisingly uncomplicated. Under my counselor's guidance, I studied, meditated on and prayed in response to passages that spoke to core issues that we had previously uncovered. I studied what scripture says about what, or rather who, my worth is found in. Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 directly challenges the lie that my ability to be loved is directly correlated with what I can offer because it speaks of the reality of my being chosen before the foundation of the world, my being predestined for adoption, my being redeemed through His blood, according to His will and to the praise of His glory. I studied what scripture says about what I can recognize as my responsibility and what I can surrender to the Lord. Romans 12, 9 to 21 directly challenges the lie that all things are my fault or responsibility because it calls me to be responsible for my own actions and to fight my own sins but independently of how others are acting around me or towards me. This passage reminds me that I am not to be the arbiter of justice, but to do good and trust in the Lord to resolve all things on this side of eternity or the next. I studied what scripture says about how I can look at both my sin and the sins that have been committed against me. 
Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 directly challenges the lie that I will always have to give in to my sinful temptations to judge or lash out in the name of self-preservation because it reminds me that I have been made alive when I was dead in my trespasses. It directly challenges the lie that my parent is only my enemy because it reminds me that my unsaved parent has also been through a great deal of suffering and I can put them in the pathway of grace by extending the same grace and kindness and forgiveness that I undeservingly received in Christ. For the first time in my adult life, I began to experience what I now recognize as true freedom in Christ. Not freedom in the sense that I can do whatever I want without consequence, but that I am free to live in the steadfast love of my Savior, free to fight my sin, free to live in His forgiveness when I fail, and free to love others without expecting anything in return. And for the first time in a long time, I began to not just understand, but also experience that peace which surpasses all understanding that Paul writes about in Philippians 4. Fast forward a couple of years, things continue to be difficult. I continue to struggle with the same fears and sins. Fear that things with this parent will never change. Fear that I will be loved only if I please others. Even fear that I will project those sinfully abusive behaviors towards my own future family, especially as my fiance and I are preparing for marriage. But God continues to show me that I underestimate His unconditional love for me and His good sovereignty over all things, and that I overestimate my ability to accomplish anything on my own. And when He graciously reminds me of this through His Word and through doing life with my brothers and sisters in Christ, it is just as freeing a truth now as it was two years ago in counseling. I'm so thankful for the perseverance and faithfulness of my counselor and the leadership that guided her as she walked with me. I look back at my time in counseling and see it as one of the most pivotal experiences of my life because it led me to a deeper faith and more fervent love for the Lord. If you are considering either receiving counseling or becoming a counselor, I pray that my testimony encourages you towards either end. And if you don't fall into either category, I hope that my testimony simply causes you to praise and glorify God because He is truly worthy of it all.